I'm Dennis Anderson along with Julie Zinner. Here's what's coming up on Almanac North. A new school year is underway at the region's largest university. University of Minnesota Duluth Chancellor Lindley Black has the latest campus news. Well, the Minnesota Supreme Court is coming to Duluth to hear an actual case bringing the court to the people. And we'll have the latest business headlines and revisit a story that was in the news 25 years ago. So stay where you are. Almanac North is next. Well, hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. It is nice to be back live in the studio for our show tonight, Julie. It sure is. We had a, we had a couple of weeks without being here on Friday night. That's right, we did. Well, we got some excellent guests, so it's your turn. All right, thanks, Denny. Welcome, everyone. It's been a good beginning to the school year at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Students have settled in for the fall semester, and the university has added some new academic programs with more on the way. UMD also recently garnered national recognition for its rankings among Midwestern universities, and that should certainly put a smile on the face of Dr. Lendley Black, the chancellor of UMD. Welcome, Chancellor Black. So happy to have you here on a Friday night. Thank you so much, Julie. It's great to be here. Lots happening at UMD. Talk yes. about some of the new academic programs that are being added right now. Yes, well, we, uh, over the last few years, have really been focusing on innovative interdisciplinary programs, especially those that meet the needs of the region mm -hmm. as, as well as the state and, and, in many cases, the nation. So, for example, uh, this, this year, we're starting our new tribal administration and governance degree at the undergraduate level. Uh, we started a, a program similar to it at the master's level a few years ago, a degree that was developed in collab collaboration with uh, Native American tribes throughout the Upper Midwest yeah. to uh, train tribal leaders. Uh, we also have a marketing analytics program that's been extremely successful. We have a new uh, financial markets program, a financial planning program. We have a new design and marketing program. Uh, a new uh, cultural, cultural entrepreneurship yeah. program mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, very uh, exciting and, and successful. Doctor, if you could uh, put something at the very top, what's the most exciting thing happening right now at UMD? Well, I think the most exciting thing probably is, is that we continue to uh, uh, do excellent work with our students and faculty throughout in UMD. Uh, like many institutions, these are, these are difficult times we're they in. Are. They're difficult times because of funding issues. They're difficult times because of changing demographics of students. And yet through it all, our students continue to excel extremely well. And I think part of that's reflected in the rankings that you mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, but most of it is reflected in the, in the high quality of our faculty and staff at UMD. Uh, we're doing uh, research at UMD that has a tremendous impact mm -hmm. on uh, this area, on the nation, and in many cases, the world. Uh, the work we do in freshwater research, the work that we do uh, in the communities in terms of dealing with social issues. Uh, our arts programs are phenomenal, and they are a true bridge to the cultural aspects of, of this region. So I, what gets me excited every day is what our students are doing. And yeah. If I'm having a challenging day, I get out of my office and walk the halls of UMD. Most people don't hear about all of this, but U.S. News and World Report certainly did. They give you a wonderful rating. Yes, they did, and there, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of various opinions about these college ratings, and I don't, I don't uh, agree with everything they do, but it's certainly uh, this year we were ranked number seven in the Midwest among uh, public institutions. And uh, the Mid Midwest region, the way U.S. News and World Report does these rankings, they have four different regions across the country. So the Midwest region includes 12 states. So to be number seven among all public institutions uh, in our region is is quite an honor. Quite lofty. What, what does that mean for the university? Does it bring in new students? Does it get you more money? Does it get 
Well, just it, the opportunity to pat yourself on the back? <laughs> <laughs> it, it certainly does the latter. Uh, bringing more money is, is not something that uh, we've seen a lot, but it certainly does help our reputation, and, and I think it does help us attract mm -hmm. students and faculty and staff. Uh, it, um, it really signals the, the high quality yeah. of the institution, and, and in fact, part of, the ratings, part of the ratings criteria are based on reputation. So if our reputation wasn't good, we, we would not be there. So what's the biggest problem facing UMD? Pro biggest problem? Well, you know, we, there's been a lot of a, a attention in the past to, to budget issues at UMD, and, and uh, certainly we've, we've had our share of uh, challenges there. But I think we've really made tremendous strides in dealing with our budget uh, deficits. Mm -hmm. And um, we started with a deficit that was somewhere around $12 million just a few years ago, and now that's down to a little over $3 million. Uh, we continue to raise um, new re revenues. Uh, we con continue to get uh, increasing assistance from the Twin Cities and from our system administrators. Uh, but we've also had to make some reductions and some cuts, and those are never easy, but like any large organization these days, you have to continue look at what you're looking at what you're doing, things you can do differently, what new efficiencies do you have, and so oftentimes uh, reductions are, are necessary. Mm -hmm. Now the students are back. Uh, we were talking a little bit before yes, we are. went on the air that we're located right on the UMD campus. And, and Notice you, the difference, Steve. As, you <laughs> come, as I came to work, you can see the students going out, out about their business on a Friday night. How are the numbers for fall this year? Uh, the numbers are good. We, we met our undergraduate enrollment targets this year. I mean, like most institutions, we're down a little bit, but overall. But uh, we're, we're up in some areas. Our Swinson College of Science and Engineering has had another big increase. Our Leibovitz School of Business and Economics has had another increase. Um, so, um, but we're, we're down a little bit in, in graduate education and in some areas of the undergraduate experience. However, we're also up in transfer students this year, which oh. has been an increasing uh, focus and priority for us as, as we're seeing fewer and fewer students come out of the high schools of Minnesota and this part of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're very much focused on, on uh, reaching out more to transfer students, and, and we're being successful at doing that. Are there any building projects going on on campus right now? Uh, there certainly are, and, and more in the works. Uh, in fact, uh, we are uh, very actively uh, lobbying and advocating for a new uh, chemistry and advanced material sciences building uh, that's on the university's uh, capital bonding request mm -hmm. for next session for the spring of two, uh, 2016. Um, and we're very pleased that it is the number one building request for the University of Minnesota system huh. for 2016. Uh, we had representatives from the uh, governor's office on campus today. Uh, the Senate bonding committee uh, was on uh, was in Duluth on Tuesday, and, and the House committee will be here next next week. So local lawmakers will make that a top priority when they get back. To uh, work. We certainly hope so. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. and it'll it'll be it'll really impact our. Our, our most popular programs in the sciences and engineering. Mm -hmm. And I understand that there's also some funding for targeted enrollment in those STEM programs. Yes, yes. We were uh, very pleased to get some extra support from the system office. Uh, President Kaler was, was very uh, uh, actively uh, engaged in that and was gracious enough to provide us some support to address areas where we have uh, high student demand but perhaps we're lacking faculty or we're lacking facilities to serve them. And so we received $1.9 million uh, for this fiscal year uh, to increase capacity in computer science, in cultural entrepreneurship that I mentioned earlier, also in some of, some of our engineering programs, and also in the uh, design and marketing program that I mentioned. The search is on for a director of alumni relations. Yes. What does that entail? Well, uh, we're, we're doing a full national search. Uh, Lisa Pratt, who is alumni director for a number of years and long time, she was a UMD alum and, and outstanding employee. She decided it was time for her to retire and she wanted to move down to Twin Cities. So uh, we're, we're looking at uh, hiring a new person, but we're not just uh, continuing to do what we've done in the past. We, we seize this opportunity to take a fresh look at what alumni relations needs to be. So we did a, a lot of uh, research with what institutions are doing across the country. Sure. We talked to other universities. And so we are realigning our alumni relations with our student life area so that 
it will have a close relationship to our current students uh, so that we think of our current students as future alumni almost from the very beginning. Right. And look at ways to engage them in the campus and keep them engaged as they go forward. And our alumni love to engage with our current <laughs> students. So uh, we're making a, a little administrative change there, but we'll, we'll do a very active and national search and look forward to having a new person soon. People see the construction going on downtown with the Maurice's building yes. going up, and when they vacate their, their space, they've donated that space to uh, UMD. What are the plans for that right now, and, and how are the talks going? And yeah, well, it's, going? It's, it's going extremely well. Oh. I, I talk to George Gofarb regularly and ask how his construction is going, <laughs> <laughs> because, and, uh, because the sooner he gets out, the sooner <laughs> we'll get in. But uh, no, uh, George and Maurice, is, is, they've been f fantastic partners with mm -hmm. us and very uh, generously have donated this building. So it's really going to be a downtown campus for us, but it will be a downtown campus focused on the needs of people who live and work mm -hmm. downtown. So we will uh, have continuing education programs there. We'll have a number of business programs there. Uh, we're looking at starting a center for entrepreneurship and innovation yeah. that'll be down there. So you could see, excuse me, you can expect uh, courses over the lunch hour perhaps, right after work, uh, as well as some evening classes, as well as some taught at different yeah. times of the day. But we're really gearing it toward uh, a downtown experience mm -hmm. and uh, appealing to lifelong learners who uh, may not be 18 year old, olds, maybe they went to college a number of years ago, they want to come back and finish a degree or maybe they want a certificate program that helps them in their current job uh, gain new skills or, or to make yeah. advances. So Dr. Black, the cost of education keeps rising. Is that affecting UMD? Sure it does. Sure it does, and it's something we're very much attuned to. We were pleased that the previous two years we were able to freeze tuition without any uh, increase at all. This year we did have a modest increase of 1.5 percent, and uh, we'll see what happens in future years. But, but uh, we're making it very clear to uh, those we're most involved with that, we, that tuition costs are a concern for us, mm -hmm. uh, not only because of the burden it places on our students mm -hmm. and, and their families, but also with, with some of our competitors, uh, particularly those in the Dakotas who uh, have a much lower uh, tuition than we do. Do you also find yourself competing with the two-year schools? Uh, so many of the, the technical jobs that, mm -hmm. that are available really only require a two-year degree these days. Yeah, we don't see a lot of competition uh -huh. from them. I mean, we do partner with them a lot. Uh, Pat Johns, uh, my colleague at Lake Superior College, uh, he and I have lunch regularly. and along with Larry Goodwin at Compare notes. Elastica. <laughs> well, we do, and we, sure. look for, we look for connections. We look sure. for ways to partner, and, and we'll be healthy if they're healthy. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I mentioned earlier our increasing focus on transfer students. And, I, and so I think we see them really more as a partner than a competitor. We don't have at UMD the kind of technical programs they do that focus on welding, construction, those kinds of things, um, but we do have first class engineering programs. So some of those students may go to Lake Superior, focus on a technical degree, and then decide they want to become a, a civil engineer mm -hmm. or an electrical engineer. And so that's when we can transition mm -hmm. them over to us. Yeah. All right, well, Chancellor Black, thank you so much for coming in and sharing some information about the university, and good luck as you uh, head into the school year. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank it's you, been Chancellor. It's a pleasure, I always enjoy visiting with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, let's dig into our News File archive for a look at what was making news 25 years ago this week. Workers using 200 pounds of explosives are burrowing deeper and deeper into Lafayette Bluff. Engineers say the approaching winter gives the operation a sense of urgency. Obviously, right now, the big push for us is to get in the tunnel several hundred feet before winter hits. Um, once winter hits, we can still work underground and the weather will not affect us. So we're pushing real hard to get in 200 feet before the winter. Department of Transportation officials say Lake Superior is threatening to wash away a portion of Highway 61. 
making the tunnel a cost-effective and aesthetically pleasing solution. I think that uh, just a glimpse at the artist's rendering as to what this tunnel will look like uh, will show you how this will really enhance that experience of driving the North Shore. Um, the landscaping that's going to be associated with this project is going to be fantastic. The $13 million highway tunnel is about 20% complete, and engineers say drilling and blasting through a mountain takes time. It's 60 feet wide and 33 feet high, one of the largest cross-sectional tunnels in North America right now, so we consider that to be pretty interesting. The rock formations here are about 20 billion years old, but in just one year and about 620 more feet of drilling, traffic will be passing through Lafayette Bluff at normal highway speeds. For Evening Edition with photographer Dave Stokes, Ryan Davenport, KDLH News. In Minnesota state judicial system, the Supreme Court is the final arbitrator of citizens' rights under the Constitution. It is the highest court in the state, yet many citizens know very little about it. Now next month, we all have a chance to learn more when Supreme Court justices travel to Duluth to hear an actual case. They will hear oral arguments in front of students at the Denfeld High School Auditorium. And the night before, a community dinner will be held open to the public to meet and have dinner with the judges. So here to tell us more is Judge Sean Florkey, Chief Judge of the 6th Judicial District in Duluth. Judge, thanks for being here tonight. It's great to be What here. is the benefit of bringing the Supreme Court to Duluth? It sounds pretty exciting, actually. It, it is. You know, to me, the primary benefit is 1,500 kids watching this argument. And it's the real deal. It's a case that they're mm -hmm. hearing. The lawyers are coming. They're bringing their A game. And it's the justices going back and forth. Um, so kids get exposed and, and they prep it. They give them materials. They're going into the classrooms. They, they, the kids will know the case going in, so they'll be real engaged. Um, and then as a community, the community dinner the night before is a chance for yeah. 300 people to have dinner with uh, the seven justices sure. from the Supreme Court. So what's the case the kids will be listening it's to? It's a workers' comp case. It's, a, it's an appeal. You know, it's a trial court workers' comp case, so it's an injured worker type of case that goes through the Court of Appeals and then to the Supreme Court. But, it, you know, the, the case is kind of a vehicle. What they're really going to see is the court doing their business, you know, and, and handling a case and then We'll open it up afterwards. I think, you know, if I'm still in the good graces with the Chief <laughs> Justice, I'll be the MC. Oh, there you go. And um, <laughs> just answer your questions, you know, get yeah. a chance to ask people what they're thinking and why they took this career path and things like that. Huh. It's a neat thing to watch. And an oral argument at the, at the Supreme Court level is, is really intense. I mean, there's a lot of preparation. These people have been working their case for a year or two years. They're often subject matter experts, the attorneys. So there's a lot of real strong interaction. Sure. Mm -hmm. Really kind of neat. Was the, the case specifically chosen because it's going to be interesting to the to the students? No, or? I don't think um, so. I, it's just, it's kind of timing and what they have coming through. Uh, it, it's, again, it's a vehicle for the kids to see how the argument works and what it looks like, and then to talk to the justices about it afterwards. Um, could there be different topics? They've had some topics that have kind of coincided with local events or local interest kind of things in the past, but this one probably not yeah. so much. But it'll be, you know, it's about injured workers and their remedies and things like that. So Judge, you mentioned oral arguments. So how does the Supreme Court case differ from a case that goes through the district court? Well, we're doing the trial court level. So we're kind of doing factual findings. We're doing jury trials. Witnesses. Witnesses, huge volume stuff, you know. My cases then go to the Court of Appeals. Uh, then those cases, so it's a winnowing number. Very uh -huh. few of our cases go to the Court of Appeals. Court of Appeals makes a decision. Then the Supreme Court can choose to take it or not, unless it's a first-degree murder case. Those are automatic to them. So it's a narrow, broad, or a narrow focus where they're really trying to shape the law. They're really trying to find, ask whether the trial court made an error, whether the law allows this or doesn't allow that. So it's kind of a more policy, big picture based kind of 
procedure. So the attorneys who are delivering the oral arguments before the Supreme Court uh, have how long to present their case? They're timed, and each case they, they change it a little bit, but it's, you know, 10 or 15 minutes and That's it. you're done. And it's fast. You'd better be prepared. Well, and, and you know, when you're arguing, you, you know what you want to argue. Well, the judge gets to decide where you're going to go. So you can, you can st I've started cases arguing to the Court of Appeals where you get seven or eight words out and that's it. You're off script for the rest of the time. Oh boy. Because when a judge asks you a question, go there, you know, answer the question. And the kids will get to see that, that, well, you can prepare your thing, but, but you're going to respond. You know, and it, it's, it's a real vibrant, real thoughtful form of mm. communication and argument. And you get to see, you know, the Supreme Court trying to figure out what's the right thing to do in a case. Mm -hmm. So the event will be held at Denfeld, but are students from other area yeah, high schools we're inviting all invited the high schools. to participate Wonderful. as yeah, well? Yeah, we've sent out invitations. We're trying to pack that place with yeah. kids, <laughs> really pack it with kids. And there are local lawyers who are going out and helping yeah. them in the classroom? Yeah, they, the Supreme, this is the, I think this is the 42nd time the Supreme Court has done this. They do, do it about twice a year. They've been yeah. Hibbing, Virginia, um, Duluth, Cloquet. It's other been a few years since they've been here. Yeah, yeah, but they, they create a package of materials, then they seek local lawyers to go into the schools and get kids prepared. Um, they'll have written materials for them. So when the kids show up, they're going to know what's going on, which is a neat way to do it because yeah. then you have more appreciation for the questions asked, the positions taken. Mm -hmm. And is there follow-up then with the students so that they actually find out what happens with this case? Or certainly, how, how, do they, how do they care? Yeah, we'll certainly that communicate day? that out. And the teachers, you know, if you've got a social studies or a civics teacher, they can sure make it an ongoing part of what they're doing with the kids as well. So it's a neat opportunity. The night before, Judge, there is a public dinner. Yeah. How does that work? You sit down and you eat with these folks. <laughs> There's no kind of head table, no speeching. It's, it's an opportunity to come and meet with the Supreme Court, talk to them. They're very real and very personable folks. So if it's someone is interested in, in going there, how would they do that? It's October 7th. That's a Wednesday evening. It's at the Kirby Ballroom at UMD, mm -hmm. coincidentally. Doors are opening at 6, dinner at 6.30. I think you guys are going to put up information about how to make contact. You can order tickets online. You can order them by phone. Mm -hmm. You have to order them by September 25. There's no tickets at the door. We keep the price as low as we could, 15 bucks for dinner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But really, it's not a come and hear speeches. It's just interact and a community dinner kind of. Yeah. We're, we're hoping to get some kids there and get different folks there to hang around and talk to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a neat opportunity. It's exciting to have them come into Duluth, I think. Now, every election day, people go to the polls and they see these judges' right. names right. and nobody knows who they are. Right. Is, it, is this an opportunity to sure. maybe get some face time? Sure, you bet. They'll all seven be there. They'll, you know, they'll sit at your table. Again, <laughs> it's just the chance to, and that, you're, it's really hard to know how to, how to judge a Supreme Court justice. You know, are you gonna look at a workers' comp court of appeals appeal and decide that you like that opinion? So this is a neat opportunity yeah. to meet mm -hmm. folks. Bringing that up, do, do you think that it's right that people do vote for, for judges? Oh man, that's, is that really on your <laughs> question? It is, right here. I, it's not mine to say, but, but it's, it's really challenging because we don't represent people. I don't get to say, well, elect me and, and I'm for you guys. We go in there to tr to try and do the right thing by every single person under the law. So it it feels weird when we're used to voting for representation and issues and whatnot to be voting for judges. I think there's a there's a fit that's challenging there. Now cameras would be allowed in the courtroom or on the, on the stage there. I don't. What we're trying to do, maybe you guys can help me. We're trying to get some <laughs> local TV station to cover it, and then then either kind of direct feed it out or tape it and have mm -hmm. it available for the public. Because sure. the argument is for the kids. That's not open to the public, but we're hoping to get it um, taped and, and sent out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the kids, are they preparing some questions ahead yes. of time? Too? Yes, so and they'll have the chance to ask questions. We're going to put a couple microphones out and have them come down, and I'll kind of be the the back and forth with the kids. But yeah, that's the whole idea is that they can then spend a good hour or better asking the justices questions. They won't talk about the case. They're not going to rule there, right. but yes. to ask them questions about how you got here and what it, you know what's important to you and things like that. How long does it usually take before the Supreme Court rules? It's, they, 
see now here this is something too we've got to have our decisions in in anywhere from 10 days to 90 days um, they have not a defined period okay. of time it tends to be three four or five months it, after it's a while yeah and it's yeah. a big writing process they're trying to write something yes. that can last for for ages i wish we had more time judge thank uh, you judge sean florkey sounds right. exciting yeah it'll thank be you. fun it'll Very be good. fun thank you Let's turn now to some of the week's top business stories from Business North. Being part of the downtown Duluth retail community has been advantageous for Duluth Trading Company and surrounding businesses. That's according to remarks made by the company's president and CEO at a Wednesday presentation. Neighboring businesses say the workwear retailer with its wacky product names has attracted customers like a magnet, doubling their traffic. The company was formed 25 years ago by the inventor of the Bucket Boss Tool Organizer. Since then, it has transitioned from a catalog seller to a retailer with a half dozen regional locations. The Minnesota Appeals Court has reversed a Public Utilities Commission move to advance the Sandpiper Pipeline. The Enbridge project involves constructing a new 612-mile pipeline to transport crude oil from North Dakota to the company's terminal in Superior. The ruling prevents the selection of a route before an environmental review is conducted. Enbridge will evaluate its options before moving forward, according to a spokesperson. Opponents say the company's preferred route threatens lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands, and wild rice beds in northern Minnesota. An alarming number of vacancies exist in northwestern Wisconsin's health care workplace, and turnover rates are high according to the HealthWorks Northwest Survey. The highest vacancy rates are for personal care assistance and home health aides at 28 percent. That was followed by medical doctors, physicians assistants, and master social workers, all at about 25 percent. The highest turnover was among dental assistants, occupational therapists, and physician assistants all above 30 percent each year. A three-year plan will be developed to address the situation. For more on these and other stories, visit businessnorth.com. Well, you've seen the topics. Now it's your time to have a say. Dial 218-788-2849 to leave a message or send an email to almanacnorth at wdsc.org. And for the latest news and information from the station, don't forget to visit the WDSC website where you will also find program listings. Summer is winding down. Sounds like another great weekend coming up weather-wise, Julie. Yeah, it should be good. The leaves are starting to change. I'm sure there will be lots of people out and about. I think you're right on that. <laughs> well, for Julie and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Dennis Anderson. Have a great weekend. Good night, everybody, and be kind. <laughs>